Hey everybody, I am Stryker here at K Rock, joined by the drummer from the band Grey Days, the band that Chester Bennington fronted before Lincoln Park. Sean Dowdell is right next to me. How are you, man? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Stryker. It is great to see you. Um, let's talk about Grey Days and get into the entire thing. What year did Grey Days start? Chester and I formed our first band in 1992. And uh, he was 15, I was 17. So he was a sophomore wow. in high school, and I was a freshman in college. And uh, he came in, he was 90 pounds, soaking wet, you know, tight curly hair. He had these glasses. <laughs> he just looked nothing like what I thought a rock star should look like. You know, how arrogant and ridiculous of me to have these preconceived notions. But uh, it's funny, then he sang, and he shut me right up. How in the world did he end up on your radar if you're in your first year of college and you're, you have this band... And he's this young, skinny kid. How'd you find each other? So I had had a girlfriend who had a mutual friend who I was playing guitar with. He knew this kid in high school through his brother. I know it's a a weird connection, but he said, this kid can sing. We should bring him in here to sing. And we said, bring him in here. Let's have him audition. We'll have him sing a Pearl Jam song. So he came in and he sang uh, Pearl Jam Alive and he was... I mean, he had that raw talent. Even at 15, he was amazing. And was he singing to a CD you were playing, or you guys were playing the song alive? We played the best version of it that we could. <laughs> we were not seasoned musicians at the time, although we thought we were. Uh, but yeah, we did the best we could, and he just sang along to it. So he's 15. This is 1992. You're a few years older than him. What was it about his voice that captured you compared to, you, to other singers that you may have brought in? So first off, he knew how to sing in key. He knew how to fluctuate his voice uh, from verses to choruses. And a lot of singers, you know, at 17 years old, I didn't have a lot of experience. But he just had this ability to go up and down and find the emotive in whatever song he was trying to emulate. We were singing cover songs at the time. We weren't writing yet. But uh, he had the ability to to just find his way and, and capture the emotional intent of everything he was pulling off. Was he a shy guy when you handed him the microphone to sing early on? No, he was not shy. He, uh, he looked like what you would assume a, shyty, a shy, nerdy little kid would be, but he wasn't that. He had this expressiveness uh, that just came through in any room. And, and you knew him personally, so you know he, that really, what you knew of him when he was alive in his, in his adulthood was really what he was when he was 15. He had this wow. massive energy that just never stopped, and he was just all over the place. And that's really who he was even when I first met him. I know you're not a creepy dude, so I don't mean this in that sort of way, but I have to ask, when you have a 15-year-old joining your band and you're already in college, do you have to go to his parents and say, I'm an adult, grown man, I've been through high school, we, we, we want your boy to sing with us? What is that? How does that work? So I was 17. I was actually out of high school a year well, early. Well, you were 17 out of high school. Yeah, I was 17 in college, well, so I was a little you. young for that. But okay. Uh, I did have to go to his parents. It's funny you asked that. He says, you know, we said, when can you start? You're a good, you're a good singer. We want you in our band. He goes, I have to go ask my dad. Can you come and, (laughs) can you come and talk to him? And I was like, sure. You know, thinking I'm so much older than him, 17. But we drove to his house and we sat down and uh, his father was a lieutenant in the Phoenix police department and he was going to work. So he was in full uniform. Very intimidating for a 17-year-old kid. Of course. And were you in. dressed up nicer than you would normally dress? No, I was, you know, <laughs> I had long hair and the thermals and the shorts and, you know, what was going on fashion-wise then. And uh, we just sat in the living room and, and said, told his father, Lee, we, we think your son can sing. Would you, what do you think about letting him join our band? And, and he's got this real deep, you know, gruff voice. And he said, you know, is it going to affect his schooling? Is he going to be home late? And he, he threw down all these stipulations. And, you know, as any 15-year-old kid would do, he just, he's promising his dad the world, I'll do it, Dad, I'll do homework six times a day to be able to do this. And, you know, he's over-promising. Uh, and uh, <laughs> his, his dad, you know, let him join. And so I had to pick him up from, for band practice after school. And How often did you guys rehearse? Early on, it was probably two to three times a week. And then as the band became more serious and we started writing for our first record and playing shows out, we, were, we became very serious for five nights a week, and we were in the studio all the time. It was our second home. That's so commendable because there's a lot of people that you have met in your life, me too, who say, hey, we're starting a band. How often do you practice? Well, this guy works at Fridays, and this guy's at Olive Garden. She's there. We practice like once every three weeks. You're starting off three times a week, then you're going five nights a week. So you guys were all in, it sounds like. 
we were all in. And even for Chester being at 15, you know, eventually 16, 17, 18, he knew he wanted to be a rock star. Mm. I knew I wanted to be a rock star. It's just something we all dreamt of doing. And that was first on the list. So our jobs, even though we all worked, and I was in college full time as well. Funny thing, when Chester moved out of his dad's at 17, uh, I was in the junior year of my college at ASU. Chester would live in my house. He didn't have a car, so I would take him to the university with me. He would sit in the classes. He would take the test. He wasn't enrolled. And then we would drive to band practice. Come and we on. did that for an entire two semesters. And, wow. Uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. And he We're... didn't do very well on the test. So we'd always give him <laughs> shit about that. <laughs> well, he's not officially enrolled. I don't know you if know, you would get This is the 90s, so nowadays you'd never be able to get away with it, right? You'd show up and you had everything's computerized, but it wasn't like that. Like right. you'd find – he would just fill, his, his, fill out his test and put his name on it, and they would post – Oh, the 200 kids that were in the class, the grades on the on the the board the next week when you'd come in at the university. So nowadays, I think you'd probably get found out rather quickly. But in the 90s, we pulled it off. The progression of the band for songwriting. So how long were you guys together as Gray Days with Chester before you went from a few covers to writing originals? Right away, we started writing originals, mm. but it took us a while to get a full repertoire. Um, we wrote probably about 150 songs all together. We were in a group together for about six, six and a half years. And we toyed with putting Great Days back together several times uh, over the 2000s. Uh, so this wasn't out of, the, out of left field. This is something Chester and I wanted to do for quite a while, but the timing had to be right. And uh, we put out two records together in the 90s. We actually recorded three full, full lengths together. And there are 10 new songs that the world will have Gray Days album, and I want to get to how that came together, but I have more questions on the progression of this band. So there's 11 songs. Oh, there's 11 the songs, record. okay. But uh, we actually have about three records worth of material that uh, wow. if this record is received well, and we think it will be, um, you guys will get to hear record number two. Nice. Where did the content come from in 93, 94 that you guys were writing? He's 17, 18. You're a very young dude at the time. What in the world were you guys writing about, and who was doing the lyrics, and how did the music come together? So Chester and I wrote all the lyrics together. Mm. Um, we would do that several different ways. He would bring a lyric sheet to practice. I would bring a lyric sheet to practice. And then once we started writing the songs and he started coming up with the melodies, we would go through the lyrics and see where what fit. He would cross stuff off. I would cross off things. We'd mix and match songs. But he primarily was the main melody writer uh, vocally, and he just had this innate talent that just came through and he was very open to writing with me I think he and I connected uh, through the lyrics writing that way we all wrote the music together Chester was not a great guitar player but he was a good songwriter so he could write really basic structure pieces and then he could write uh, melodies over the top of this and then the rest of the band would kind of finish up um, writing the actual structure of the music but he, he and I wrote a lot of the stuff together and we really connected on the lyrics and a lot of the stuff what was the band growth like? What did it feel like for you guys at the time in the Phoenix, Arizona area? What was the scene like? What was the buzz like for you guys? So early on, it was very difficult in Phoenix to try to break through because you had bands like the Jim Blossoms and the Refreshments and oh, then yeah. eventually the Funk Junkies that kind of all punched through that ceiling, right? And here we were, this kind of post-grunge rock band um, trying to fit in a scene where we didn't really fit. But eventually we created and curated a, a fan base that were – diehards and then towards the end in 96 97 98 we were playing in front of 1500 1800 people wow. every show selling it out and when we play with uh, national bands like bush or no doubt we would hold our own and they'd be coming up to us after the show and be like who the fuck are you guys like th you guys really are not a local band so we could hold our own in that fashion and we we eventually became um a mainstay in the phoenix in the phoenix scene all right so 99 2000 happens and Chester joins the band Linkin Park. Did that create a riff at all in your friendship? Did you understand why he left? What was the feeling between all the guys at that time? So the riff was created actually right after a show. We had a big blowout fight in uh, Tempe, Arizona. The bass player uh, at the time, Ace Byers, he was having some addiction problems. Oh. We were all having some ego problems, if I'm being completely honest. And things culminated to a tipping point, and we got in a big fight after a show, and everyone told each other to F off, and we all went our own directions. And then our lawyer was in L.A. at the time. We had had we literally had just signed a, uh, a production deal with Warner Brothers to go in the following weekend and record four songs 
um, for Warner Brothers. And then when the band broke up, you know, a couple of days before that happened, uh, our attorney, Scott Harrington, called Chester and said, hey, I have this other band out here I think you should come audition for. And then within a month or two, I think he had recorded a demo and then flew back out here and then joined those guys. And that was a band oh. called Zero, and that eventually became Linkin Park, as you yeah. know, the history for that. But, uh, no, we had had a big blow up, and then when he joined LP, I went my own direction in a band called Waterface, got a deal with EMI, and funny enough, our albums came out the same week of the following year, following year in 99. Uh, so we... Uh, hadn't talked after the band broke up we were we were best friends and then we just split up and there was this major rift until 2000 and 2002 when he called me uh we had found out our our original guitar player bobby benish had been diagnosed with brain cancer oh man and he called me said look man you're one of my best friends i don't know what the hell we are fighting about i miss you I said, I miss you. I'm sorry. He said, I'm sorry. And then from that moment on, and that was right after Hybrid Theory had come out, and uh, he was hitting on all cylinders. And you know, he didn't need to rekindle our friendship, but he 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 called me. Is he? You know, we had a we had a true bond, and uh, I was I'm like so an older brother. So glad you guys got back together in 2002. That is awesome. And Sean, you know more than anybody, and I know this while talking to you now, why bands that are huge break up. You've seen it. I mean, it was it happened right in front of you. Yeah. It did. And, you know, a lot of it was my own fault. And you have to you have to hold yourself accountable in situations you find yourself. Right. Otherwise, you can't grow from it. And uh, I think it's one of the reasons we did rekindle is that both of us had grown to a point uh, and Mace included in that. Uh, we all found ourselves going, you know what, this is definitely a large part my fault. And, and here it is. And we were just very open and honest about it. And uh, and then from that point on, Chester and I became business partners. Club and, Tattoo. You know, when did Club Tattoo start? That was 90s, right? So 1995, originally, the bass player, Mace, and I decided to open up a tattoo shop while the band was touring. And Chester helped me lay the tile and paint the walls. And like, <laughs> like I said, we were inseparable at the time. Yeah. So he was around for all that. And then Mace and I dissipated our partnership in 96, uh, but still stayed in the band and maintained the band. And then uh, in 2003, uh, Chester called me and was just having this odd phone call. He says, you know, I'm doing pretty well and I'm making some money. Is there any way I could you know, maybe go into business with the next club tattoo. And I laughed. I said, sure, yeah, what do you want to do? So literally within six months, we opened up uh, the third tattoo studio. And then within a year, we did a, a global shoe line with Etnies for club tattoo. And then things just took off at that point. We ended up opening a total of seven studios. And we're on the Las Vegas Strip and the casinos. And How many are in Vegas right now? One or two? Three. There's three club tattoos in Vegas. And what about in the Phoenix area? Arizona, we have four studios. Good for you, man. Thank you, that man. That is awesome. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. So 2002, you guys are friends again. You're doing your thing. The business is going great. Chester's doing Lincoln Park. We know the success of Lincoln Park. And then tragedy strikes in 2017. And now here we are in 2020, and the material that you recorded with Chester and your other two bandmates is coming out, and maybe some of you are watching now. It's already out there. Tell me the process on why and how this is happening, the Grey Day songs. Okay, so in 2016, uh, Chester called me. We talked maybe once a week at the time because um, we're business partners and friends, and he was on the road. He said, you know, uh, the, we had done these big parties for Club Tattoo, these anniversary parties annually. And we hadn't thrown one in a couple of years. And these parties were big. We would three, th anywhere from four to 5,000 people would show up to these things. Chester and I would do this all-star band where we would get up on stage and play. And we'd have other national bands play. We had Mike play with Fort Minor. We had Alien Ant Farm and Jada Pinkett Smith and Z Trip. And we had, it was a really cool festival. We had professional skaters on half pipes while we were playing. It was a spectacle. And he called me, says, let's do another club tattoo party. We haven't done one in a couple of years. I said, cool, that sounds like fun. He goes, and let's put Great A's back together. I think it'd be fun. He says, I miss having a rock band of my own. I miss playing with you. Let's do this for real. And I was like, all right, let's do it. So that was kind of out of left field a little bit. Was that and the first time you guys had talked about that, or was it brewing over the previous years? We had toyed with it several times. Once in 2003, when we had heard that Bobby was diagnosed, we were going to do a reunion show, and then once again in 2007. But the timing was never right. And then in 2016, he had he had just left Stone Temple about a year prior to that. And uh, he, he just told me, he goes, you know, Sean, I just miss, I miss playing with my friends and, and, and 
having a thing of my own, and I, and I just want to do this. And I said, okay. And then so as we started talking, we, we made an announcement online that we were putting the band back together and doing a, a concert, reunion concert and all that. Um, you know, the idea kind of started talking back and forth as we were talking, let's go back and re we have this whole catalog of music. Let's go back and re-record it all and put it out. And he was like, let's do it. So we started working with a producer in January of 2017. Mm. And he was going back and forth on the new One More Light tour, I believe. And uh, I would work with a guitar player and the producer um, going back and forth. And I'd email him the tracks. And he'd say, I don't know if I'm feeling this. And I said, yeah, you're right. And uh, we just kind of came up with the idea, let's, let's try to rewrite this stuff and modernize it a little bit. So as we lyrically started, lyrically and musically, no, not lyrically. We wanted to keep the structure intact because the integrity of the songs were there. They were good songs, especially vocally. Like when you hear these vocal performances, I think it's going to blow people's minds that you know he was doing this in 1997 and 21 years old. It's just it's good. Yeah. And so we kept we had that uh, concept. You know, this is a concept of how we were going to do it. And then we were supposed to start rehearsals. Uh, I want to say it was July 22nd or 23rd of 2017. He had just gotten oh, off man. the road. Uh, he was in Sedona with Talinda, as you know very well. And he flew back to L.A. to uh, shoot a, a, a TV commercial or something for State Farm, I believe, with the guys. And then he was – Talinda and the kids were going to drive down to Phoenix. He was going to fly from L.A. down to Phoenix. We were going to have dinner and then start rehearsals on a Sunday. And, of course, what happened happened, and it never uh, came to fruition. <sighs> Unbelievable. So now we are, what, two and a half years later or so? Yeah. Um, you can, you've continued the project. So the world stopped when he passed, as you know. And uh, I know you were close with Chester as well. And, and, I, just and I really got close with Chester. You know, I started playing Lincoln Park like 99 ish, 2000 on the radio. But it wasn't until we started doing the charity stuff together in like 2010 where I really got to know him. I mean, we didn't really text or email. We, we do interviews and stuff. But that's when I really got to know him and see a different side of him. And I'm so glad and feel very fortunate that I got to see that side of him from 2010 until 2017. He, he really was a very genuinely nice, compassionate and human generous, being. Generous, generous guy, too. Absolutely. Very generous. And uh, so when he passed, you know, Everything stopped, and I had uh, the loss of my friend. My friend's wife is now a widow. Her children are now fatherless. Uh, my business partner's gone. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts here, and the band was just kind of stopped. And like, this is a non, this is a non-issue right now. I have many other things I got to deal with, and uh, I didn't think about picking it up again for about eight months. And I just every day would go by, and just just grate on me. Like I just couldn't stop thinking about him. And the things that we didn't get to finish. And I finally woke up one day and told my wife, I said, I just, I think I'm just going to finish the record. Me, Mason, Kristen will go in the studio. We'll just finish it. I'll, I'll pay for it. We'll just put it out. It's not about being a rock star. It's not about selling millions of albums. It's just about finishing what we started. And that's how it started. And you already started it. I mean, you had started it while he was here. Yeah, absolutely. What about the time and energy it's taken to get this thing done? A ton of time, a ton of energy, and uh, originally I was funding everything myself, which was fine. You know, we're very successful in what we did, so that, that wasn't an issue. But, you know, we eventually partnered with Tom Wally at Loma Vista, and we had a bunch of labels coming to us and trying to get the music and offering us, you know, big things, but it didn't feel right. It felt exploitive. And when I talked with Tom, he said, look, what you're doing is cool, but in order to make this – something I want to work on. It's got to be great. And there's certain things we have to do to make it great. And the first thing is we have to maintain the integrity of what you're doing here. We can't sell this thing out and do this half-assed. If this takes four years to finish, it takes four years to finish. And it ended up taking us two and a half years. But uh, that's when I knew he was the right partner for the project. He wasn't swinging the largest check. He was coming in with the right intentions from the get-go and slowing everybody down, not trying to hurry to the finish line to make a bunch of money. That was never the intention. And that's why I have a lot of respect for Tom. And uh, he's taught me a lot about the right way to approach the, 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 the project. Um, there's some pretty cool musicians that have joined this whole process. Is Monkey from Corn and Head from Corn? They yeah. worked in Carafe, I think, and the artist LP, who I love. Absolutely. Yeah. So 
during the process, it came to me since we had lost our original guitar player. We had other friends that were very close with Chester that never got a chance to play with Chester. And Head and Monkey were two at the top of the list. And, and Head and I have um, maintained a friendship for, for years going back to you know, early 2000s. Um, and we were talking on the phone one day, and I said, can I send you some stuff? I just want your honest feedback. And I sent him one of the tracks we're working on, and he picks up the phone. Dude, this is unbelievable. What is this? And so I walked him through the story. <laughs> right. And, and How just, validating did that feel for you, man? That had, had to feel really good. It did feel good, but I'll be honest. Head's one of those guys. He's always telling you how great things are. So, <laughs> you know, he's just a, he's one of those awesome guys like Chester. Yeah. He's just a genuine – he's a genuinely nice guy. He would never say a bad word, even if he thought your stuff sucked. So – in all fairness, okay. <laughs> I didn't know if he was telling me the truth. And I'm like, really? So we walked through that whole exercise. He's like, dude, this is really good. And then he, um, I talked to the guys in the band. I said, what do you guys think about having Head come and playing on this stuff? So I talked to everybody, talked to him, and he said, absolutely, I, I'm in. But he goes, would you mind if Monkey came in? I go, fuck, of course not. Fuck yeah. Bring him in. So Head and Monkey came out to NRG and uh, – one of the coolest things is that they did their homework, man. They showed up and they knew the track and they had written a bunch of stuff for it. And I just felt so grateful that these guys showed up. Which song? Uh, B12 is the song that okay. they play on All and right. they throw down. It is awesome. They did a great job on it. And so that's how the process started. I said, you know, if we're going to bring in extra people to play on the record, they have to either be somebody that Chester really admired. They really admired Chester. Somebody that Chester wanted to play with and vice versa or just – there has to be a connection there. I don't want to just bring in names to bring in names. And uh, the, that's the way we kept the integrity of it. So we had Cara Fay, uh, who sang on uh, The Syndrome. We had uh, Marcos uh, Curiel from POD. He plays on the track that's on the radio right now called What's in the Eye. Yep. We had Chris Trainer from Bush. He plays on several tracks. He's a guitarist. Yep, guitar player for Bush. And uh, he and I became close friends after this as well, and he does a great job on uh, Soul Song and just like Heroin, and he plays on What's in the Eye. And musically, he really understood what we were trying to go after is a whole concept of the record. So that's he fit on like five songs, I believe, and plays with Kristen. We have uh, Paige Hamilton from Helmet plays on wow. uh, Sickness. And uh, we have a, a, a vocalist, and this is a good story. Chester and I were driving to lunch one day in 2016, he says, you got to hear this girl, man. She's amazing. And I was like, okay. And he was, you know him. He was like the, 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 the monkey who couldn't sit still all the time. So he, he, no matter if he was telling me about a coaster or if he's telling me about the greatest thing in the world, the energy level is always at 11, right? right? So he, he puts on his iPod or whatever in the car, and it's this girl, LP. And he's, and he's playing me this track called Lost on You. And he's just freaking out about her vocal inflections that she can just go upwards and horizontally with her voice at the same time. And he's just going off about it and just telling me how much he loved this girl. It was the first time I had ever heard her. So when we're going over uh, the songs, there was a song called Shouting Out um, that I wanted a female to sing with him on. This is where we had originally done it on one of the, on the first record, Wake Me. And I said, who do we know that's out there that's a female voice that would fit this, this song? And I'm talking with our friend Renee. And uh, I said, do you know this girl LP he used to freak out about? And he says... I don't know her, but I know her management. Let's see. And he sends a text. And within five minutes, when do I, when can I, when do you want me there? Wow. And uh, she showed up and she kills it. She does such a good job singing with Chester. It's something I think he would be ecstatic at the finished product on. The way he sang it and his recordings are from the past, but the music, as you've mentioned, has all been redone. Correct. Right? That's and okay. It, yeah. So the music is, is, is set in a modern format that's relevant to the today's listener right and again his lyrics are still relevant today that he wrote then absolutely it's awesome the album is called amends absolutely 11 songs um wow what a project and thank you for thanks for sitting down man thanks for having me Strag. i really I appreciate, appreciate it. it this was a really fun conversation i'm very inspired by this whole thing too in one or two sentences you you mentioned theme of the album what is the theme of the album so there's a lyric in one of the songs called more ace guy and the lyric is, if I had a second chance, I'd make amends. And through this entire process, the lyrics that he and I wrote together have become quite prophetic in hindsight. I'm looking back at a lot of the things that we were saying, especially the things that he was saying. And it's almost like this album has come a bit of an apology from beyond from him. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the words are very meaningful 
Um, and that word amends says just covers a lot of grounds, I think. It and it's going to bring closure for some of his fans, and it's also going to bring a way to connect for others. Um, I just want it to be healing, I guess, is, is the best way that I can put it. I want the music to be healing, and hopefully the, the listeners take that into account and understand that the intentions were from the heart, and they're, they're, it was meant to be a good thing and bring some, uh, some healing to, to people. Perfect. Well done. Thank you. Good job. Sean Dowdell, Gray Days is the band. Go listen, check it out. Um, the art will live forever. For Sean, I'm Stryker. Thanks again for hanging out. It is the world-famous K-Rock. See you guys.